Grace and peace to you. Welcome to worship here at Trinity Presbyterian Church, whether you're checking us out online or listening in on the radio. And if you're watching us on Sunday, I want to just say a word of uh, appreciation to all of our dads on Father's Day. We honor you and, and celebrate you and give thanks to God for all that you mean to your family and to your children. I just have one announcement this morning. Next Sunday, June the 28th, uh, we'll be going on a virtual mission trip to Guatemala. Uh, that'll be each night that week starting at 7 o'clock, and we'll be doing it all on Zoom. And so we'll be checking in with our mission partners and others who are doing great work on the ground. And we hope that you can join us, not just if you've been to Guatemala in the past, but if you've always wanted to go but never had an opportunity, uh, we hope that uh, you'll join us for this mission experience. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God. We worship God with gladness for the grace and mercy that transforms our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hear these words from Psalm 146 as we seek to be transformed once again by God's grace. Let my whole being praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and that it, all that is in them, God who is faithful forever, who gives justice to people who are oppressed, who gives bread to people who are starving, the Lord who frees prisoners, the Lord who makes the blind see, the Lord who straightens up those who are bent low, the Lord who loves the righteous, the Lord who protects immigrants, who helps orphans and widows, but who makes the way of the wicked twist and turn. The Lord will rule forever. Let us worship God with open hearts and open minds today. Friends, if we say that we have no sin, we are simply deceiving or lying to ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So Christians, let us search our hearts knowing that God meets us with mercy, forgiveness, and an opportunity to be sent to share God's mercy with others. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we worship you in faith and with hope, trusting in your grace that forgives and changes us. Lord, forgive our sins, sins of commission when we intentionally harm others, and sins of omission when we fail to do what is right and just. Your justice protects those who are weak, yet we seek the shelter of privilege and power. Your righteousness redeems those who are poor, yet we seek the status of wealth and possessions. Your peace upholds those who are oppressed, yet we seek the security of weapons and retribution. Forgive us our sins and lead us to true repentance, that we may trust you in all things. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, God moves human hearts toward forgiveness. And when our hearts are moved, the Spirit changes us. By reorienting your life toward a God of justice and mercy, know that you are forgiven and be compelled to seek justice in your words and deeds as well. Amen. 
God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Happy Father's Day. And I say that not only to biological fathers out there, but to anyone that's been a father to any child. I wasn't just blessed with my biological father. I was also blessed to have my stepfather and two grandfathers love me, pray for me, and teach me about God's love. Maybe your father is not even related to you. Proverbs 27, 27 says, The righteous who walks in integrity, blessed are the children after, that come after him. I like the way the message says this. It says, God loyal people living honest lives make it much easier for their children. So on this Father's Day, may your children call you blessed and may you be God loyal men that make it easier on your children. Happy Father's Day. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word read and proclaimed by praying. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, fall on us like the rain and shine on us like the sun in the hearing of your word which inspires us and in the Spirit's encouragement to serve which changes us. Encounter us with your spirit today, O Lord. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and beginning at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, 
There is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Chris and I recorded a video earlier this week where we introduced the series that we're starting today. In case you didn't get a chance to see that, let me just say by way of introduction that we have put aside our worship plans for the next three weeks in order to reflect on and to talk about the tragic events that have engulfed our nation. Of course, I'm referring to the death of George Floyd and others and the subsequent turmoil in our country with marches and protests and urgent calls for an end to racial injustice. The level of pain in the black community and elsewhere is nearly at the breaking point. And it touches us as well. It's our pain too. The Bible teaches us that if our brother or sister in Christ is hurting, then we all hurt. We all suffer. That's just how it works. We're all connected in the body of Christ. And so the first thing that we want to do is just pause and feel that sadness, enter into that grief, for we weep with those who weep and we mourn with those who mourn. And then the next thing that we want to do is we want to ask the question, what do we do now? How do we respond? What's the appropriate posture for us to take as followers of Jesus? Chris and I know that we don't have answers to all the questions that people are asking right now, but we do have the resources of the scriptures. We do have God's word to help guide us in these uncertain times. One of the passages that we think can be real helpful in this conversation is one that has been meaningful to God's people throughout the centuries. It's from the Old Testament book of Micah. Micah is a prophet in the Old Testament when Israel as a nation is facing a terrible crisis. And he begins by asking this fundamental question, with what shall I come before the Lord? In other words, who is God calling me to be and what am I supposed to do in this circumstance? Now, of course, the prophet's context is different from ours, but he is asking the question that we're asking. God, how can I please you in these difficult, confusing, and uncertain times? Micah wonders aloud if God will be pleased with some kind of sacrifice. He begins small and then he escalates. The prophet asks, shall I come with burnt offerings? A burnt offering could be a dove or pigeon that would be sacrificed at the temple. This would be a rather ordinary offering, something that most people could afford. Next, he says, shall I come with calves a year old? A calf would have been an expensive gift. Many families couldn't afford this kind of offering. But Micah isn't finished. He goes on, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Now, this is an offering only the wealthiest of the wealthy might have been able to give. It was almost beyond imagination. But Micah continues, will the Lord be pleased with 10,000 rivers of oil? At this point, he is in the realm of impossibility. 
the prophet escalates things to the point of being ridiculous. No person could offer God even one river of oil, much less 10,000. But Micah doesn't stop there. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? Now, Micah knows that human sacrifice is forbidden by God. Um, he is not advocating for that in any way, shape, or form. He is simply taking this discussion to the highest point, pushing it to the furthest limits. He is saying, would God finally be satisfied if I gave him that thing which is most precious, which has ultimate value to me? The point of this passage is that none of those things are what God really wants. God does not primarily want anything. Instead, we find that what God wants most is our hearts and our lives fully yielded. God wants us to act in ways that reflect God's character. God invites us to love the things that God loves. And we'll see what's primarily at stake is the way that we treat those around us, especially the marginalized and the suffering and the needy. This is how Micah puts it. With what shall I come before the Lord? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? What God wants most from you and from me more than anything else is justice, mercy, and humility. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about each of these things that God desires most. And today we're starting with justice. Now, in some people's minds, the word justice is a political word, and therefore it carries a lot of baggage. But justice is actually a Bible word, and I think it needs to be reclaimed. Isaiah 61.8 says, For I, the Lord, love justice. In the Psalms, God gets the title, Mighty King, Lover of Justice. When Moses is giving the people instructions, God says to him, do not pervert justice, do not show partiality, follow justice and justice alone. All through the Bible, hundreds of times, this word justice gets lifted up as something precious to God. What does God want? God wants justice. And that leads then to the next question, what is justice? What exactly does the Bible mean by this word? Well, the fundamental principle of biblical justice is that you should never treat a human being as if they have less worth than they actually have. Justice means recognizing and honoring the excellence of all that God has made. God created humanity in God's image. Every people group, every nation, every tribe deserves equal treatment, equal dignity, equal respect. Why? Because we are all image bearers. So biblical justice means I never treat another person, no matter how different they look, no matter how different I think they are from me. I never treat another human being as if they had less value than they have. And so we prize and we nurture everything that God has created. And that's why, as I said earlier, biblical justice is not a code word for some kind of human political agenda. This is not a blue state word. This is not a red state word. Justice should never be used to polarize. Instead, justice is something that we have to love if we're going to love God. Why? Because God is a lover of justice. So the next question is, how badly does God want justice? Well, God wants it really, really badly. So badly that God instructs the Israelites to say the following words every time they gather for worship. This is from Deuteronomy 27, verse 19. 
The priests or the Levites are to pronounce before the people, cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the alien, the orphan, and the widow. And then all people shall say, Amen. Now, you will often see um, th these groups mentioned together in Scripture, the alien, the orphan, and the widow. And the reason is they were the most susceptible to injustice. They were, for Israel, what we might talk about as marginalized people, people who are most likely to be treated as less than. And then the text says all the people are to respond to the words of the priests by saying amen. Now, amen means truly or may it be so. And those are kind of sobering words to say amen to, right? What we are saying is, may I be cursed if I withhold justice from those who are most vulnerable. May I fall out of favor with God if I treat with partiality anyone based on who they are or what they do or where they're from. And that's a pretty strong statement to make. And I wonder, would we be willing to make that kind of commitment, to take that kind of stand? You see, it's not enough to be neutral when it comes to the issue of racial injustice. In fact, this text says there is a direct link between the work of justice and our relationship with God. So just to review, what should we give God in this season of such heartache and suffering in our nation? God wants justice. And what is justice? It's when every human being is treated according to the worth they have in God's eyes. And then how much does God want justice? Really, really badly. And then one last question who does God want to use to bring about justice? And well, that would be us. And we're going to talk about some practical kinds of things over the next few weeks. But as we close, let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, God, who has reconciled us to himself in Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice the language here. Reconciliation is a ministry. Reconciliation is not about voting in a particular way. It's not about belonging to a political party of one sort or another. It's not even about what cable news network you choose to watch. Reconciliation is about the life of faith. And what that means is that working to heal broken relationships and to correct the systems that foster inequality is a calling that God has placed on all of us. We all have work to do. And you need to know that when it comes to the ministry of reconciliation, there are no guarantees. Reconciliation is not e easy, it's not orderly, and it's not quick. You can think that you're done and then you realize there's more work to do. But there's nothing like true reconciliation where trust gets reestablished and relationships are rebuilt and community gets restored. Friends, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. So we don't write anybody off. We don't discard anybody. And when there's anger or hurt or bitterness, we take the first step. We listen. We seek to understand. We confess. We forgive. We seek to be reconciled to others just as we have been reconciled to God through Christ. God says through the prophet Micah, I don't want you to bring me your burnt offerings if your heart is not right. I don't want your worship if you're not seeking to honor God with the worth that I have given them. Here's how serious this is. God is singularly unmoved when God's people gather to worship, but they don't care for or pray for or move towards those who are marginalized in our society. And that's why as a church, we will not be the kind of people 
who honor God with our words, but then dishonor God with the way that we handle our relationships with others. Our God loves justice. And so we ask God to help us to love it too. Let's pray. Now, God, would you give us the strength and the courage and the inclination to pour out our lives for the sake of this world, especially for those who suffer injustice, especially for our black and brown brothers and sisters in Christ. And most of all, God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on a cross, who suffered grave injustice for our sake so that we might be made right with you. We offer you this day not only our worship, but our lives and service to all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christians, we turn to God with a common hope, hope that we may learn from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so today, let us turn to God by claiming what we believe together, saying the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, today's prayers of the people will emphasize moments of silence. So when I say, O oh Lord, hear our prayer, there will be a brief time of silence for you to say your own prayers or to simply meditate. May God's intervening presence be with us, and let us pray. God of justice, mercy, and guidance, we worship you, bringing our daily lives to this time. Some of us rejoice with praise, and some of us lament with tears. Still, we all come to you in this space of worship to be renewed and reconciled to you and to each other. Lord, as we explore your call to justice, we know the work we must do to self-examine and to be more self-aware. It is not easy. So God, open us to the molding of our inner and outer lives. Lord, for change within us, we pray. O oh Lord, hear our prayer.
as we navigate a world where answers are not always clear. We pray that you may help us to listen before we speak. We pray for those whose voices may be silenced due to race, faith, age, nationality, viewpoint, income, or gender. Lord, for clarity to hear those who are silenced, we pray. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. As we seek to understand loss that people experience across our community, we pray for those who grieve loss this week, whether that is through death, or severed relationships, or simple isolation. Lord, for comfort to those who face loss, we pray. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, on this Father's Day weekend, we thank you for all caring fathers and parents and parent figures. We pray that you will help all people and all of your people in the church to care for children and youth and anyone who is vulnerable in our world. Lord, for just actions in our lives as the church and in our individual lives, we pray. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. And so, God, we pray with faith in Jesus, who lived, healed, taught, and welcomed in this life, who brought the kingdom of peace to this world, and who died and rose again to make all things new. We pray in faith that we may be changed as we pray the prayer that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we heard today, the prophet Micah reminds us that God is interested in the reorienting of our daily lives. And so as we worship, we seek to give thanks to God in word and in action. So we invite you to share as you can toward the work of God's church as we seek to do justice in the world and to care for all God's children. Let us pray. God, we praise you for your care and for speaking to our hearts. Help us to give of our time, talents, and treasures so that your vision to do justice may be lived out by your church. Bless these gifts to care for all. Amen. Dr. Martin Luther King famously said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I believe that the opposite is also true, that justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And so that's why God invites us to do justice in the place that God has put us. We never know how small acts might be a part of God's greater purpose. Friends, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And now as this service ends, go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.